It is a real pleasure for me to introduce this particular speaker, and not just because Colonel Watson is from the White House military office, and who knows what, what that can mean. But uh, Brian and I served together in the Air Force. He, had, he was another one of uh, my executive officers that, that suffered through that little trial. I uh, have a number of them. And I, I'm glad to, for him to be here and for Adam to be here and talk about Kate and, and some of the others uh, because I want my students to know not bad things don't always happen to people associated with me. Sometimes good things happen. And uh, I like to think Brian is, is one of those examples. He is a truly gifted officer in every way. I mean, right now he, he is really in his... Um, uh, lawyer mode in the in the White House, but he's a fantastic leader, uh, did a terrific job as Staff Judge Advocate in one of the, the toughest bases at one of the toughest times in, in history at Aviano Air Base in Italy, and uh, has really done it all in, in the JAG Corps, and I'm looking forward to even greater things in the future. Without further ado, I've asked Brian to give you, a, in his ethics presentation, I want to give you, uh, especially those who may not have a lot of experience with government, a little bit of perception of what it's like to be in government and what the ethical constraints are and also ethical slash legal constraints and also uh, what, uh, how that if you're outside of in dealing with people in the government, what is in the people's in the government's mind and what constraints that they are being told about. So hopefully uh, 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 Brian will be able to address a few of those things. Outstanding, sir. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Everybody good? All right. You know, I'm going to try to accomplish about three things here, right? We all want to, I know what, how it is. You know, we're thinking about lunch, right? We're thinking about lunch. We're thinking about leaving. I get that. I'm the, I have the highly coveted slot right before everybody's released for freedom, right? But we're also thinking about making sure we get our hours worth of ethics credit. You know, I'm under no delusions about this, all right? Uh, when General Dunlop asked me about uh, coming down and, and talking, first of all, I was absolutely thrilled about the prospect of getting outside the Beltway because we're all, we're all honest with each other, right? Uh, any day outside the Beltway is a great day. Uh, that's a wonderful thing. Um, and so I decided, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the three R's, I've got, I'm a dad, I've got kids, my wife homeschooled, uh, three R's, so the three R's are very important in the Watson household, about cultivating an ethical culture in a hybrid environment. All right, little, tell you real quick a little story. Um, I've got, when I was a kid, I had two grandparents, both of them were farmers. My grandfather on my dad's side had an eighth grade education, my grandfather on my mom's side had a high school education. My grandfather, who had the eighth grade education, absolutely brilliant man. I learned very early on in my life never to equate education with intelligence. Two things could not be further apart, okay? Uh, I, the, uh, he's a man who built a barn using only the measuring tools that he had were a measuring tape, a, uh, a carpenter square, and a level. That's it. He built it by, with his own hands, okay? Interesting guy. He also taught me a little bit about hybrids, and this is where I want to talk about this today. We've talked a lot over the last couple of days about hybrid war, hybrid conflict. I want to talk about a hybrid environment because I am absolutely convinced we're all going to work even more in hybrid environments. What am I talking about? Every day I go to work, I work with people who are in uniform. I work with people who aren't in uniform. I work with political appointees. I work with contractors. I work with people who flow in and out all the time out of business. All right, That's what I'm talking about with a hybrid environment. You know, when I was a kid, my, my grandparents, they grew beef cattle, they had corn, they had soybeans, all that kind of stuff. I learned from an early age about what hybrid means. In that sense, hybrid means you look at the strengths. You look at the strengths across the spectrum and you bring them together with a purpose, right? With a purpose, because you want to make the whole system stronger. Huh. Put that in your memory bank, if you would, with me, and we'll come back to that in a minute. An ethical culture. My grandfather's also taught me that whenever you, if you don't plant something, first of all, what you want to plant isn't going to grow, but something's going to grow. And it might not be what you want. So how do we cultivate the right kind of culture that's going to happen, whether you, you're mindful of it or not? How do you cultivate the culture you want 
in a hybrid sense. All right, with those, that little bit of frame of culture, I want to talk about this. All right, that's where we're headed. I wish ethics were as easy as reading them on a sign, right, as you're cruising around the beltway. It's not, because goodness knows we need more signs in the beltway. <laughs> I wish it was that easy, but, it, but it's really not. Here's where we're headed. Here's the docket for today. Uh, I'm a former judge, so I, I talk in terms of a docket sometimes. People, uh, I get mixed reviews on that sometimes. I want to talk about an ethical culture, why we're here, how we got here. I want to talk about the core principles of ethical conduct. That's some black letter rules that hopefully uh, uh, we can all uh, digest as we, as we dive through it. Uh, I want to talk about conflicts of interest. This is where I'm going to get into some black letter law here. Because, uh, uh, hey, I've got the obligation. We've got to talk about black letter law. We're getting CLE credit for this stuff, right? We're going to talk about gifts. We're going to talk about using government resources. We're going to talk a little bit about social media and ethics, OK? Because that affects every single one of us. Uh, Post-government employment. Um, and then that's where we're going to kind of stop on the black letter rules. The reason I want to talk about the black letter rules is for a very specific reason. Can I take a quick poll in here? How many uh, uh, law students do we have? Law students, OK, great. How many folks have been practicing law, let's say, less than 10 years? All right. How many people are not even affiliated with either being a lawyer or a law student? But you love lawyers, right? <laughs> Bless your hearts. Bless your hearts. So we're going to talk a little bit there when we, when we phase out of where we were. We're going to phase into this ethical failures, a possible explanation, at least from this particular lawyer, as to why we engage in ethical failures. And I want to talk a little bit about a client's view. Because I think that's absolutely critical. It's something we don't spend enough time on, uh, especially for our young lawyers, younger lawyers, and our law students. Okay, That's the reason I have that particular block uh, right as we get towards the end. All right, deal? That's where we're headed. Disclaimer, mandatory disclaimer. Hey, if there's any, anything stupid that gets said, it's my fault. It's not, it's not a trivial of anybody else. All right. Here's where, where uh, uh, I want to head. This is my intent uh, and some proposed rules of engagement as we go. Number one, I've got prepared materials. Uh, I want to talk about whatever it is you want to talk about, though. If you have questions, please raise them as we go. Uh, I want to focus on hybrid environments like I talked about just a minute ago. It can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Hopefully, I've framed that issue for how we're going to talk about it while we're together. I want to talk about black letter rules. I want to give you some source materials. And this last bullet is important. Tools that we can use with our clients. My time up here, hopefully, if I do anything, I give you some tools that you can take back and talk to your clients about. Uh, whether it's a, a specific video you might be able to show to your clients, if it's a black letter rule, if it's a handout, something like that that you can use, I want to give you tools that you can use. Last thing, I'm going to talk about some very specific cases. Okay, I'm going to talk about some specific cases. Please, I want to foot stomp this absolutely <coughs> critically. Everything that I tell you is coming from publicly available sources. Okay? It's not like I'm going to try to give away any state secrets or anything like that from the inside. All right? Um, if I went around the room and I asked every single person in here what an ethical culture is, what an ethical culture means, I would probably get as many different answers as there are people in this room. And quite frankly, that's okay. That's okay. Here's a definition that's probably as good as anyone. We've all got to be willing to highlight ethics issues when we see them. We've got to be ready, willing, and able to enforce standards when we have to. We've got to allow other people to talk. We've got to allow other people to talk about ethics issues when we see them. In other words, what are we talking about? It's a leadership issue. That's all this is. This is about senior leadership, senior strategic level leadership. And for you young lawyers out there who are going to be counseling clients, especially if you're in uniform, I would ask you to push this point and push it hard. Ethics issues are not just issues for lawyers. Ethics issues are for issues for leaders. These issues have some teeth. This is a document from 2015. Uh, it's from September. I'll go ahead and build it out because I know you can't see it, maybe in the back. The title of it is a report to congressional committees. It's dated September of 2015. So by GAO report standards, yeah, it's a GAO report. You know, it's one of those things, you know, every time I see a GAO report, it kind of makes my teeth itch. Yeah, I, I, I don't really want to want to necessarily open that thing, right? But because we're lawyers, we like nothing better than cuddling up on a on a Saturday morning with a GAO report. Yes, that's exactly what we like to do. This one's important, everybody. This one is called "Additional Steps Are Needed to Strengthen DoD's Oversight of Ethics and Professionalism Issues." It's just from a few months ago. 
It's in September 15. So by GAO report standards, it's pretty recent. Here's what it says. This is from page one. If you can't read it all the way from in the back. Uh, can you guys read it in the back okay? All right, good to go. Um, so this, this is, this is kind of important stuff. Professionalism, sound ethical judgment, they're important, they're essential to executing the fundamental mission of the Department of Defense and to maintaining confidence in military leadership. This is Professor Fever from yesterday, right? This is that civil military relations thing that we were talking about, that trust that we absolutely have to have in our military leadership if our military is gonna be able to do its job. This is important. Let me build it out again. Next line, military personnel are required to adhere to ethical principles and standards of conduct. Has to do with those things on the very last line, financial disclosures, conflicts of interest, gift acceptance, travel. Yeah, we get all that. Here's where the stress level starts going up. Recent DOD and military service investigations of misconduct by active duty service members, including generals and flags, including generals and flags have placed DOD's ethics and professionalism programs under increased presidential, congressional, and departmental scrutiny. Uh-oh. These investigations have revealed misconduct related to, among other things, ah, sexual behavior, bribery, travel, use of government funds, and cheating. Publicly available document, okay? You Google this thing, you're gonna be able to find it just like I did. Now. You're like me, you look at the footnotes, okay? So you may be sitting there as you're reading through this paragraph today, you saw the footnotes that are sprinkled through it. And so when I saw this, I started asking myself, why would they drop a footnote right after they're talking about sexual behavior, bribery, travel, use of government funds, and cheating? Well, they started naming names, okay? <clears throat> This is how you know you're gonna have a bad day. All right, this is your first indicator, all right? Um, these are some cases that you've probably read about, you've heard about, um, but I would get my sense, you know, that maybe somebody somewhere is losing patience. It's not just GAO. You know, this is the national security strategy. Those of us in the room who like to read documents like this, you know, it's the national security strategy, and what does that have to say? Well, here's what the White House says. We will recruit and retain the best talent. This is about the military folks, by the way. And in the national security context, it probably says the same thing about national security folks outside of DOD. It says, we will recruit and retain the best talent. That's you guys, congratulations. While developing leaders, that's you guys, congratulations, who are committed to an ethical and expert professional of arms. It's important stuff. I'm not making it up. It also comes down to trust when it comes down to Executive Order 13490. If you're, from, if you're not familiar with what it is, it's the Ethics Pledge. This is one of the very first executive orders that the president signed right after he took office. Okay, this is the Ethics Pledge that talks about political appointees having to comply with certain ethics rules. And by the way, when you read through that thing, I was very proud to see that that particular document tracks pretty closely with the Joint Ethics Regulation. Okay? We should be very proud of it, those of, those of us who are in uniform. Okay? It, it defines what an appointee is for these specific reasons. It includes full-time, non-career presidential, vice presidential appointees. If you look down at the very bottom, it does not include military service members. Okay? It's because we have our own specific ethics rules. So my message to you is it's not just across the uh, uh, DOD, it's across the entire federal government, and it's across the entire national security apparatus. Yeah, the rules can seem a little bit complex. What am I talking about? You look at that, at that picture, and you don't know whether or not that person's in uniform. I'm not in uniform, I'm an active duty military member, all right? There's a lot of folks who are in uniform here today. You look at that picture, you don't know if they're, in, if they're contractors, you don't know if they're political appointees, you don't know if they work for the CIA, you don't know if they are students, you don't know who or what they are. This gets a little interesting where I work, because sometimes we have people who are sitting right next to each other. Maybe you can accept a gift, but maybe you can't. Maybe you can lobby a particular contractor, maybe you can't. And then you wanna to come to me and say, why don't I get to lobby that contractor? I'm riding on the same plane, I'm doing the same work, I'm doing the same mission, why is that? And my message to you is that, that's what has to do with creating that ethical culture, right? Because that's what it's about. How do we answer those issues? Because they're not easy to answer and people oftentimes don't like the answers. 
I want to talk a little about organiz organizational culture. Those of us who are students of human behavior, organizational culture has to do with building a common identity. I believe this. I think this is absolutely critically true. It gives guidance for us how we act, how we interact with each other, and how we interact outside the organization. The battery's a little weak. The coffee's not. There are certain visible aspects of organizational culture that we learn about, uh, and those things are the artifacts. Those are the clothes that we wear, the rituals that we have, the ceremonies we do, the, the changes of command that we do, the retirement ceremonies that we do. Those things are important. They're important in building our, our organization, our stories, our symbols, our slogans. But they're hidden aspects of organizational culture, hidden aspects. And one of those things is our values. Our folks up here were talking about um, during the last block of instruction. Um, and, and I'm very privileged to have the chance to, to give the last uh, pitch today because I think there's very interesting ethics ways, ethics related ways, that some of the lessons we've had over the last couple of days really come together in an amazing way. The, uh, uh, I remember uh, Professor Newton was talking about values. He talked a little bit about values. Um, Professor Cummings was over here and she talked about how our need to get out in front of some of these issues and shape the battle space, if you will. I believe it's true here too. If we don't cognitively, if we don't purposefully, if we don't think about how we're building our ethics culture in our hybrid environments that are not going to get any easier, they're going to get more complex. If we don't think about how we're going to do that, we're going to fail. We're going to fail. This is where it gets tricky, and this is exactly what I mean. What exactly is the organization in a hybrid environment? What's the organization? You know, Admiral Crawford last night, he was talking about some of the, uh, the, the possible need for a Goldwater Nichols look, relook at the interagency structure. I think it's worth, th worth thinking about with some of the really smart people in here. Uh, is there a need for some common ethics rules across the hybrid culture? Just a thought. History is a teacher. You know, we've, we, we know about our, our good friend Carl. We study Carl, right? We study uh, 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 Clausewitz all the time. Uh, those of you who aren't familiar with who and what he was, he's from the early 1800s, late 1700s, early 1800s. He's a Prussian military leader, a theorist. We study the, the holy heck out of this guy because he looks at the moral, psychological, and political aspects of war. Okay? That's what he does. It's a great little quote that Carl gives us. The soldier trade, if it's to mean anything at all, has to be anchored to an unshakable code of honor. Otherwise, those of us who follow the drums, those of us who follow the drums, become nothing more than a bunch of hired assassins walking around in gaudy clothes, a disgrace to God and to mankind. Hmm. It's interesting he has an opinion, I think. All right. He also tells us, and this is going to look a little familiar to the military theorists in the bunch, there are certain tendencies or characteristics of conflict. What does he say? Number one, there's an emotional tendency and motivation to conflict. There's a non-rational force like chance, friction, probability. There's that piece of armed conflict. He talks about there's rational traits, very rational traits about conflict too, like calculation and reason. And he assigns roles to these, right? He assigns roles to these. He says that the emotional piece is the people. He talks about how the non-rational forces belong to the military. And he talks about how the rational traits like calculation and reason belong to the government. That one could be up for debate. All right, that's what, that's what Carl tells us. So let's talk about each one of those. Should be familiar to you, right? This is the Trinity. This is Clausewitz, a remarkable Trinity. Don't you like slides that do tricks? The Clausewitz and Trin Trinity is usually what we use in order to frame the idea of how politics informs war and how war informs politics. What is the mechanism we use in order to make sure that we win, right? I would ask you to think about it a little bit differently in a, a slightly different framework, because I think this Clausewitzian trinity is useful for another purpose. I think it makes a very nice framework to talk about ethics issues. What am I talking about? This is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the linkages between the people, the military, and the government. What do we have if we have a situation where neither the people nor the military trust those in, in political authority. What do we have if we have a situation where the people or the government don't trust those of us who wear a uniform? 
And what happens if the, the folks at the bottom two, two legs don't trust the people up top? Those trust relationships, I would posit, are probably one of the most important things that holds a democracy together. And that's important, that's important, because of the ethics rules at play. What other institutions could fit here? I would submit to you that the other institutions that would fit here would be the other institutions who are just like the practice of law, our teachers. You don't have to look too far in the news in order to really think really critically about it. How about the police? Okay. What happens when that trust relationship between the people and the government and one of these institutions is broken? I'm going to move now into the core principles of ethical conduct. I know you can't read it in the back. I did not intend for you to read it in the back. Uh, what this is is the 14 principles of ethical conduct that OGE points, puts out. This isn't mine, this is OGE. In the event that I put the graphic up here because some people like having these at hand. I do, I keep a hard copy of these uh, close by because this is a great way for me to be able to talk in very plain English uh, with my clients about ethics issues. They may not understand the subtle differences in, in uh, uh, 5 USC uh, uh, section 2635, that really long CFR provision that talks about the, uh, all the ethics rules. I'm not gonna wade through them with that. But if I need to bust out a copy of the 14 principles of, of, of ethical conduct and lay it on a commander's desk and say, this is why this is the answer, that's a very easy thing for me to be able to do. Just a suggestion. The, uh, the key concepts that really boil down these 14 principles of ethical conduct, and the graphic up there, the reason that's there is because if you want to go out and find it, that's what it looks like. It really boils down to public service being a public trust. There are certain financial rules and conflicts of interest rules. There's gifts rules. You've got to treat people fairly. That's one of the 14 principles of ethical conduct. You've got to treat people fairly. You can get a lot of mileage out of, uh, out of that one if you put it in the right hands of the right lawyer. Uh, we've got to use government property and resources in the right way. More on that here in a few minutes. The ones that really get people uh, spun up sometimes is we have to report fraud, waste, and abuse, and corruption when we find it. Not rocket science. It's not a fun thing to do. I tell folks that this is not about being that schoolhouse snitch that we all hated as a kid, right? Uh, or the, the kid on the playground that was always tattletailing, okay? Any of us who've been around DC long enough to know whenever there's an ethical uh, investigation that starts to unspool, what happens? The second question that gets asked is who knew what and when did they know it? I always tell my clients, don't let yourself get caught in that blast zone because that is not a, 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 a pleasant place to be, right? Uh, the last one is we have to avoid even the appearance of wrongdoing. That's a nice little thing to be able to slide across the desk to, some, to a client uh, who maybe is wanting to skirt the edge, right? And saying, well, I wanna, I, I, if I go ahead and do this, I, I'm not gonna be technically in a, running afoul of the ethics rule. That's your opportunity as a practitioner to say, yeah, you know, you might be right, but let me br break out the, uh, the OGE ethics rule that says you've got to avoid even the appearance. Okay? Nice little, little tool for practitioners to use, I think. I also tell folks about this, and this is something that I think we don't do a good enough job of teaching senior leaders about, and I'm absolutely convinced we don't do a good enough job of teaching lawyers about. When these, and I'm a, I'm a veteran of some of these uh, investigations, and when they start to unspool, Okay, uh, I've seen some of these things happen in real time. At senior levels, at very senior levels, the impact of ethical violations can be incredibly far reaching. What am I talking about? Watch the graphic, if you will. There's a reason I had it do that. Because when there's an ethical violation, an ethical allegation, what's the first thing that happens? In regarding to, a, say, a commander, a very senior leader, what's the first thing that happens? Remove them. They come out of the organization, they're placed somewhere else so that they can go ahead and be under investigation. Okay, it's not always fast, we all know that, right? But oftentimes we turn the focus on that person for a lot of good reasons, okay? What are his or her rights? What are the rights of the investigation? How's that gonna unspool? We forget to think about the organization. Do you see when I made the, 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 the switch? It literally cut the knees out from under that first rank. I've seen it happen, you've seen it happen too if you think about it, right? It leaves the organization in a really tricky situation. There's a direct impact on the next seniors, okay? Oftentimes, not only are they impacted personally, not are they impacted professionally, they get called as witnesses. Because whatever the, the person who's under investigation did or didn't do, they have a direct involvement. We also have very rapid and unexpected vacancies, 
okay? We didn't plan for that. It wasn't, it wasn't a normal rotation because it happened like that, sometimes overnight. And sometimes there's difficult and long <laughs> transitions. Believe me, I've seen those happen. We don't plan for this. We don't. We don't plan for this. And it's very hard to convince somebody in a position of authority that they need to plan for their own unexpected departure. But if anybody should be good at telling clients to plan for their unexpected departure, it should be lawyers. When's the last time you wrote a will for somebody, right? It's the same principle, right? It's the exact same thing. You're trying to uh, uh, let people think about what happens if I'm not here tomorrow. And what's their obligation to? The people who are left behind, right? We help folks navigate the ethics rules. Yeah, we get that. Ethics is about more than just following the rules. It's a culture. Hopefully, I've talked a little bit about what I, what I mean in order to frame some of those issues. But in ethics-related issues, and I absolutely firmly believe this, we should not shrink away from our responsibilities. Because there are certain things in this world that if we don't do it, ain't nobody going to do it. Okay? And we have certain unique capabilities, too. A couple of those unique capabilities is the ability to disregard the irrelevant. Okay? The lawyers and the young, young uh, uh, law students here in, the, here in the room, I would submit to you that you are growing capabilities that you don't even know you have. Okay? I'm going to say that again because it's important. You are growing capabilities that you don't even know you have um, because they're instinctive. You learn them at such an early part of your cognitive development as a professional that you don't even you And the danger is we think everybody else has it. Okay? They don't. The ability to disregard the irrelevant, the ability to counsel a client from a, a kind of detached point of view and help them through a very difficult pr uh, process as that very trusted insider. Okay? Those are unique capabilities that we have. There's a rule that's directly on point on this, too. You know, it's about more than just knowing the law. It's about more than just following the law. Uh, that very last part there, Rule 2.1 of the ABA rules talks about how we can give legal advice that is tempered by other considerations other than just the law, right? It talks about our, uh, our ability to tap into that moral, social, political factor that can be relevant to the client's situation. One of the very interesting capabilities that we have, okay? So next time lawyers, next time somebody tells you, hey, you're just, just the lawyer, not really, because you've got capabilities and the ability, the ABA says you do, to talk to people about stuff that you think is important, right? There's a safe harbor in the law on ethics stuff, OK? Um, if an employee, we all know this, it should be black letter law for folks that practice in the military. We should all know this. For those of you who may not be practicing, in the, in, uh, uh, practicing attorneys, uh, it's good for you to know this too, I think, because I think more and more American taxpayers ought to realize this. If an employee seeks ethics advice and they give all of their facts to the ethics counselor, and the ethics counselor, the ethics advisor, gives them an opinion, and if that opinion is wrong, whose fault is it? It's not the, it's not the person who came looking for help, OK? It's the ethics advisor who's at fault, OK? That's a really remarkable get out of jail free card, OK? That is designed to make sure and encourage folks to come forward and, and, and tell us what their issues are uh, instead of uh, having the problem later. Uh, it's so important, though, at the same time, more, some more black letter law for everybody. Ethics attorneys always remain representative of the federal government. It does not create that classic attorney-client relationship. It's important. Uh, there's not a safe harbor for the statutory and the criminal provisions. We're going to talk about that here in a few minutes. And there's obviously always the right to conduct, uh, uh, have contact with military defense counsel and other lawyers. Other lawyers, meaning if somebody wants to go out and hire somebody on the economy. I will tell you a little bit of a practice point that I've developed over the years. Um, having practiced in this area for, for gosh, 20 plus years, uh, I will, as a practitioner, I will advise on military justice stuff verbally, okay, uh, over the phone. I will advise on uh, legal assistance in person verbally. Okay, that's how we do it, right? Somebody comes and talks to us about a divorce, we're going to talk to them about child custody, child support, property division, alimony, all that kind of stuff verbally. I'll advise on contracts, I'll advise on physical issues, labor issues uh, uh, verbally. I've gotten to where I've stopped doing ethics work verbally. I do it in writing, okay? 
Um, and sometimes people look at me and they say, hey, Brian, you're spending a ridiculous amount of time working on this stupid issue that deals with a $200 ticket to XYZ banquet. And I say, nope, it's a good investment, OK? Because when I give that ethics opinion, I make sure I lay out what facts I got because of this, because of this, OK? I lay out what facts I got, the opinion that I gave, and the fact that the opinion I gave is based on the facts that I got, and my opinion will change if the facts change. New facts, new decision, right? Okay? I've gotten to where I don't do my ethics work verbally anymore. I do it entirely in writing. Just a practice suggestion. I'll leave it there. I want to talk about conflicts of interest. People come to me all the time. They say, hey, Watson, what's a conflict of interest? I say, well, a good example of a conflict of interest is where, say, you've got somebody who's got a problem and creates a problem. Maybe somebody creates a problem, then they charge money to fix the problem, right? My kids love this, OK? Yeah, Chuck Norris, <laughs> attorney. I represent injured people. I think that's a pretty good example of a conflict of interest in a very classic sense, yes? I found this when my kid was, my, I've got a 17-year-old, so he, he went through this phase where he loved Chuck Norris jokes, so yeah. <laughs> if you have a good Chuck Norris joke, come tell me afterwards. Uh, conflict of interest, here's the black letter law on conflict of interest. It's Title 18, United States Code. I drop an asterisk on that because all the lawyers in the room, you know, as soon as you see Title 18, the hair on the back of your neck probably ought to stand up, okay? Uh, the, uh, what is, why, why is that? Criminal, that the uh, Title 18 of the United States Code is where all the federal criminal provisions are, okay? This is one of the things you can get people's attention with when you talk about it. It says employees don't get to participate personally and substantially, this is language right out of the statute, through decision, approval, recommendation, advice, investigation, or otherwise, in a judicial proceeding or other particular matter. I can leave out some of that stuff because particular matter really catches it. That's the term of art that we use in the ethics business. In which the employee or their spouse, minor child partner organization, which they're an officer or an employee or a company with whom they're negotiating for employment has a financial uh, interest. Okay? Yeah, it's a federal crime to do that kind of stuff. All right? But that's not the only rule. Hmm, not the only one. Uh, there's 5 CFR 2635. Again, 2635 is that really long provision in the Code of Federal Regulations. The paragraph 502 just happens to talk about the impartiality rule. It looks and smells and feels a lot like that conflict of interest statute that we read just a few minutes ago. But there's a difference. The difference. If you look at the red stuff right there at the end, it says there's a lot broader application and reach than the criminal conflict of interest statute. What am I talking about? Because the covered relationships are the term of art under this particular CFR provision, okay? Covered relationships, and it's broad. You could, you could, you could, it captures just about everything. It even captures, what is that last one there? It, it talks about a, a former business partner, okay? Yeah. In other words, if it stinks, it stinks, okay? That's what it is. And I tell my clients, this is what I tell them. I say, look, I'm not going to turn you into a lawyer today. But what I do tell people is, you know, this particular CFR provision, your guidepost should be if it looks funny, or if you think it looks funny, or better yet, if you think somebody on the outside looking in would think it looks funny, you and I need to talk, okay? That's how I leave it with my clients, okay? I have two specific cases I want to chat with you about today. Uh, this is the first one. Um, some of you may be familiar with this case, OK? Uh, I'm only going to talk about, in fact, there's probably people in this room who have worked on this case, OK? Um, so please let me lay down the marker right now that I'm only going to talk about stuff that's in the public, public sphere, OK? That's all I'm going to talk about. This particular two-star was a commander down at Fort Bliss. Anybody ever been to Fort Bliss? Sprawling installation, right? Sprawling inflation, installation. You can launch a missile on one end. You can land at the other end. Nobody's going to hear it. Huge. So there was this particular contract contractual action that the uh, uh, local base installation commander was responsible for. It had to do with upgrading the infrastructure at that installation. And during the particular uh, uh, the, the, the time that this two-star took over the installation, he walked into a particular situation by his own, his own statements in the press, where he talks about the fact that when he got there, he needed to, quote, clean up the contracting squadron or the contracting entity, the contracting office. So it was under that kind of rubric where he decided, you know, as this contractual action is pending, guess who comes to visit? Knock, knock, knock. Hi, General. We're your uh, classmates from West Point. 
We're not in the military anymore. We are contractors, and we would really like this contract. Lots of back and forth. I'm going to read to you right out of, the, uh, right out of this particular news story, because it is important. The investigation into this particular officer began after there was an anonymous whistleblower who alleged that the general had, quote, abused his, his authority by awarding lucrative renewable energy contracts to his friends. Okay, See a problem yet? Yeah, we got a problem. But there's more. Several Army officers, this is right out of the Washington Post article, several Army officers, including his staff lawyer, told investigators that the general went to unusual lengths to push a no-bid contract run by two of his former classmates from West Point. The Army's IG, CID, and FBI, they all got involved. He responded. He got punished. He's no longer in command. His response is what I want to I focus on here. He says, I invited a measure of risk with the contracting process. This is him talking. I have always operated with an understanding that some risk is acceptable in taking action that will benefit our force. So what we had was a senior officer who told the press that, hey, it was okay to take some risk in the law. Got a problem with that? Yeah, there's probably several folks in this room that have a little bit of a problem with that. He went, goes on to say, if my example deters other senior army leaders from taking bold risk in the future, that is unfortunate, he says. I would submit to you, if this, this is accurate, and I don't, if this is accurate, and I don't have any reason to believe it's not, we've got a senior officer who had a little bit of the wrong sight picture. Amen? Willing to take risk when it comes to violating the law. That's not what taking risk is about, okay? It's not what it's about, not even close. Um, this is this General Jackson story from yesterday, right? That's what this is about, okay? So we can see these linkages, and, I, and again, sir, thanks for the chance to come in here and talk last, because I think it's good to think about some of these national security problems that we've talked about over the last couple of days and kind of look at them through an ethics lens. I want to talk about gifts for a minute. Here's the black letter rules. We've seen these before for those of us who practice in law. Uh, uh, practice law in the military. We know, we know how this stuff plays out. It says employees will not directly or indirectly solicit or accept a gift from a prohibited source or be given because of the, official, the employee's official position. People kind of forget the last part. Oftentimes, as ethics, as ethics lawyers, we focus on this, the, the first part, this business about a prohibited source. The definition of a prohibited source is right up there. I'm not going to read it to you. For the non-lawyers in the crowd, basically it boils down to contractors. If somebody has business dealings with the federal government, they can be considered a prohibited source. We don't take gifts from prohibited sources. Okay, That's the overarching rule. We also don't take gifts given because of our official duty position. Okay, This all goes back to that civil military relations nexus that we talked about yesterday, right? The trust factor, the fact that we have the obligation to make sure that people trust those of us in uniform. Okay, That's what this is about. The definition of a gift is up there. There's exclusions, too. I know it's pretty tiny. It may be hard for you guys to read, but it's just the, the small stuff. There's exclusions. Uh, the rules are written by lawyers. The so lawyers write exclusions. I don't know what it's about. Here's the most uh, common exceptions, OK? These are important. First one's the $20, $50 rule, a little black letter law for folks. The $20, $50 rule says that I can accept a gift from a prohibited source or a gift given because of my official position, as long as it's worth less than 20 bucks on a one-time good deal, as long as the total value of those gifts doesn't exceed the amount of $50 over a year. I don't know why it's not $20, $60 rule, because that would be three $20 gifts. I don't know. It's a $20, $50 rule. In fact, you know, you can't get much for 20 bucks. 20 bucks isn't even worth 20 bucks. 20 bucks uh, might get me a, a cup of coffee at Starbucks or something, right? Um, a very nice Duke t-shirt. Yes, sir, it will. I'm pretty sure of that. And that's the point, right? That's the point. We're not supposed to be getting cool stuff. Um, gifts based on a personal relationship. Now, the way this plays out, and this is, this is where this plays out in this hybrid environment, right? You have a senior officer. He says, hey, I'm meeting with my roommate from college. Well, roommate is now part of the team, and the roommate on the team is a contractor. And the contractor shows up at, the, at the, your boss's office, knock, knock, knock. Hi, here's my $200 tickets to the show tonight. 
that a gift given because of the personal relationship? Or is that a gift from a prohibited source? Which is it? Okay? That's where this gets tricky, and that's where we, we kind of have to get through here. And this gets back to philosophy. Okay? This gets back to philosophy. And Admiral Crawford's uh, words last night are really echoing in my ears. Okay? He was talking about how, as, as military lawyers, we try to get to yes. We try to get to yes. Okay? But sometimes the answer is no. Now, he reserved the no at his level. I get that, and I totally get that. That is a great practice for a senior JAG. Okay? But at the same time, you know, you're looking at this business, and I think this would be a great opportunity based nothing more than on the facts that I just gave you of sliding that copy of the 14 Principles of Ethical Conduct right across the desk and saying, hey, look, sir, look, ma'am, even if you can accept this gift, should you? Because otherwise, you run the risk of an allegation you don't want to have to deal with. Gifts from foreign governments, sometimes these come up. Uh, uh, the, uh, sometimes they, they, they uh, uh, can get a little bit of comp uh, some complications to them. It's when the fair market value, there's a tripwire, just so everybody knows, it's 375 bucks. If it's a foreign, gift from a foreign, um, uh, foreign government entity, if it's over, over 375 bucks, you can't keep it. If it's less than 375 bucks, you can. A little, uh, little place that, that I would offer a practice tip in this particular area. Uh, I have seen ethics lawyers get too wrapped up in the law on this, okay? Uh, and what am I talking about? I'm talking about the fact that sometimes we have very junior folks who might receive a gift. They run it over to the lawyers and they say, can I keep this gift? Yeah, no problem. And they hustle off and they, because it's 20 bucks from the local mayor of whatever, and they take it back. The commander never knew about it. Okay? Their commander never knew about it. Their chain of supervision never found out. And if you don't tell them, nobody's going to. And you can tell them, because remember that slide where I talked about ethics counselors? That does not create that attorney-client relationship. You're working on behalf of the federal government. It's kind of your job, I think. There's also a security piece to this, too. Uh, where I work, we foot stomp very, very hard. Whenever there's gifts, we, what's one of the, the first thing we do? We run it through the uh, uh, folks at service in order to scrub that thing and see if there's anything else in there other than just the very nice litho, if you know what I mean. <clears throat> Anybody know this guy? Fat Leonard. Fat Leonard. All right. This is the second one I want to talk about today. Um, I have to tell you, uh, I do not um, take any pleasure at all in how this is unspooled, OK? Please, please understand that. Um, but I have to say that I cannot imagine any ethics briefing or ethics training uh, in this day and age that doesn't talk about this case, especially in a national security context. If we're here at the Center on Law, Ethics, and National Security, this has all three of those, right? Law ethics, and national security. Again, I'm only going to talk about the stuff that's in the public sphere. Uh, Fat Leonard is also, that's his nickname, um, because, well, um, his actual name is Leonard Glenn Francis. He runs a company called GDMA, Glenn Defense Marine Asia, OK? Ran a company. Um, the, as part of what that company did for a living, that company takes care of and does husbanding surface, services. I'm an Air Force guy. I didn't know what husbanding services were, but I found out. Husbanding services are when a ship pulls into port. Somebody has to take care of all the care and feeding of that particular ship, and they can go ahead and, uh, and get it all ready and go back out to sea. Well, lo and behold, uh, this particular company was engaging in activities with people in the Navy. And there's a, this case is still under investigation. DOJ is handling it. Tremendous numbers of folks, just about by any standard, who are, who are kind of caught up in this thing. It's causing a lot of problems in the Navy. Um, but bottom line, what was happening was he was offering personal gifts, a lot of personal gifts, apparently, to some fairly senior decision makers uh, that, and were at, that was actually influencing the movement of some ships. I'll say that again, actually influencing the movement of some ships. Okay? In other words, in order to, to be the successful husbanding company, you've got to be where the ship needs to need you to be when the ship comes in, right? And that's how this was happening. There were gifts of, of, of many thousands of dollars, whatever happened to the $20, $50 rule. The ship would come in to port, and there would be these parties, there would be these lavish kind of receptions, very unfortunate. Um, whatever happened to that $20, $50 rule? Yeah, kind of interesting. Um, and, and you know, as this plays out, uh, you've seen lots of people uh, uh, obviously get tried in federal court for this stuff, um, and there's more coming. That's what the, the press reports keep saying, is that there's more on the way. It's extremely unfortunate. There's lessons to be taken away from this, though. Um, 
If nothing else, this case has cemented in my mind, and I want to make this absolutely crystal clear. This is one of those things that I would ask you to write down. There is a direct nexus between ethical conduct and national security. They're linked. Okay? I get some, some looks from the audience saying, yeah, of course. Um, but there's people who don't necessarily um, make that connection. There's too many people who will look at ethics issues and they'll say, oh, that's for the lawyers. It's not. It's for everybody. Heard this, this quote before, a soldier will fight long and hard for a bit of colored ribbon. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's from Napoleon. You know, he, people sometimes cast that quote in a couple of different ways. Unfortunately, the Fat Leonard case has made me think about it this way. And this is where I think senior leaders ought to look at it. A blank will do what for what, OK? That Fat Leonard case, he was given uh, 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 prostitutes, handbags, Lady Gaga tickets, electronics, all kinds of stuff to folks in order to influence decision making, OK? Very unfortunate. Unfortunately, this is where we are. Talk about using government resources, and I'll go ahead and pick up the pace just a little bit. Yeah, there's, a, there's an abuse of government resource. There's an abuse of government resource. We're really talking about money, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, <laughs> not Photoshop. Um, we're really talking about money because people's, people's uh, assets and people's time, all that kind of stuff. Here's the rule. Uh, it's all valuable. What I do, what you do, what all of us do on behalf of the federal government, it, it's valuable. Um, the, uh, in order to use official government, purpose, uh, official government assets for personal use, you have to jump through these particular hoops. It can't adverse, or reflect adversely. It's got to be reasonable, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. You've got to get clearance from your boss. Where we see this typically is right here, using government resources when it comes to government electronics. Okay? Here's the rule up here. There's, there's little subtle nuances across the different agencies, but this is a big one. When it comes to internet and email, there's the rule. You can read them for yourself really quickly. Bottom line, you can, in the military, you can use your official government computer, your gov official government email for personal use. But hey, howdy, there are records implications. We all know this, right? This is, this is stuff that should come out. By the way, the archiving work that is being done by our IT folks, they look sometimes at our, at our records and they say, you know, we're going to keep your records. And you guys, as users, me, we don't even know what's being kept, OK? Really important lesson to be learned. Bottom line, here's the common sense rule. If you don't want to see it splattered across the front page of the newspaper with your picture next to it, please, please, please do not send an email. And oh, by the way, that applies to personal email accounts as well. Social media. All right, my lovely wife, she, uh, she tells me all the time, she's like, hey, Brian, you're a great consumer of information on social media, but you're kind of a cruddy producer of information on social media. And I say, yes, dear. You're exactly right. That's how, I, that's how I want it to be, OK? How many folks use Facebook? Any Facebook? Come on. I know who you are. Come on, I can hear you breathing. Facebook. How many folks use Twitter? How many folks use Instagram? Anybody use Instagram? 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 How many Snapchat? No, don't answer that. Um, the, uh, uh, what could go wrong, right? Uh, there are some very specific rules that deal with social media. I would commend some of these uh, issues to you. If you haven't seen this document, and I'll go ahead and blow it up here, because I want to make sure that this is one of those tools you can use that I go ahead and, and leave for you. It's from 2015. It's the OGE Legal Advisor, the Office of Government Ethics, put out a legal advisor dealing with social media uh, and the ethics rules associated with it. Here's what it talks about. I'm not going to go through every single one of them. Um, but there's conflicts of interest. Yeah, when you're out there uh, doing whatever you do on, on LinkedIn and Facebook, there could be conflict of interest problems, especially if you're dealing with one of our, quote, teammates or one of our hybrid environment folks and how you're interacting with them. Hmm, we need to think about that. Impartiality in your official duties. What about the, when you're going out and you're making recommendations on LinkedIn or whatever it is in order to uh, recommend people for positions or jobs or endorsing them or saying that they're really good at what they do? Hmm, misusing government property and time. There's people doing this stuff at work. Uh, referencing to your, uh, your government title and the appearance official, of, of official sanction in what you do. Seeking employment, okay? All that kind of stuff comes into play. It's very easy. It's not like the, the, the chore of putting together a resume and shooting it out across to a, to a whole bunch of folks. Uh, endorsing other people, using non-public information, fundraising, election year issues. I want to talk about this real quick. Here's another tool you can use. I just found out about it literally about a week or two ago. I didn't get it in time to actually roll it into my, uh, my pitch because I didn't get to really dig into the video. Um, the Air Force actually put out a really good video. If you go out and Google it, you'll find it. Uh, it put out a really good video dealing with social media 
and election year issues. Uh, I loved it so much that once I saw it, I shot it around to, to some of my clients saying, hey, this is a really good distillation of, of its DOD directive, 1344.10. That's the big muscle mover in this area. And it really puts that stuff in a, a, a nice, concise uh, way you can use it. How about embarrassing and security clearance issues? Well, rumor has it, there's a media site out there, a social media site called Ashley Madison. Anybody heard of that? Yeah. yeah. All right, it's a matter of currently in litigation. You know, there's, yeah, mm -hmm. um, there, Ashley Madison, uh, we'll call it Mashley Radisson right now. Um, apparently, there, it's this website that if, it, 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 their little tagline is what? Who knows it and wants to admit it? Life is short, have an affair. Life is short, have an affair. That's what it says. It's people who are actually going out there fishing for an adulterous relationship. That's what this site is geared for, apparently, I hear, okay? Um, really has made, the, made some splashes uh, uh, in, in the news lately in military contexts. Not pretty stuff. Post-government employment. I'm going to move through this fairly quickly. Um, seeking post-government employment, here's the general rule. There's a general rule that if you're seeking government employment under these particular circumstances, you've got to disqualify uh, from the actual duties that you're performing. Okay, violations can be prosecuted. This is, a, this is a criminal provision here, guys. There are representational bans, representational bans. Don't uh, try to read the slide. If you're interested in this stuff, shoot me a quick note, or just go look at the statute. It's 18 USC, section 207, criminal statute. 18 USC, hey, the hair's on the back of the head. I ought to start sticking up. I want to get to this, because I want to talk about, talk about this. A possible explanation for unethical conduct. I'm like you, I've been a prosecutor, I've been a defense counsel, I spend some time on the bench as a trial judge. Every time I see one of these cases come up, I have the same reaction that you do. It's like, first thing thought through your head is, why would they do that, right? Well, you're familiar with this, okay? You may not be able to read it in the back. This is an article that's pretty old. I'll read the title to you, I see some people squinting. I'll read the title to you. It's kind of old, but it's making a resurgence. I'm hearing a little bit more about it. It's called the Bathsheba syndrome, okay? It made the rounds again over a dozen years or so ago, and it's kind of making a little bit of a resurgence. What it is, it uses the old uh, story of David and Bathsheba that we all know from a particular, uh, from a literary context as a frame of reference for why it is that people run off the rails. Why do they run off the rails? And so what did the, the authors, and I'm not buying everything they're selling, but what they, what they boil down to is success can lead to failure. Why do senior folks sometimes get in trouble? Huh, this is what they say. It can cause some leaders to become complacent and lose focus. Some leaders, not everybody. It results, success also results in privileged access to information and people. And I would submit that, that applies to every single one of us in this room. That's the way the military, the national security structure works, right? If you are successful in job A, you move up to job B, and you get even more access to information and people. It permits power over resources, success does. It can also mislead some leaders into believing that they can manipulate outcomes, okay? Manipulate outcomes. In other words, I'll never get caught. And if I do, I am such a rocket scientist genius that I'll be able to get out of it. Not so fast. It's worth thinking about next time you're on the treadmill or on the hamster dancer thing or whatever it is that you do at the gym. It's worth kind of, kind of um, scratching your head and um, thinking about it. So what can we do? We can educate folks. We can remain vigilant. We got to speak up. It's part of the job, OK? I want to talk next, and I'll get through this as much of this as I possibly can, because this is about understanding our clients. I think we've got an obligation when we're dealing with our clients um, to know where they're coming from, especially if you're dealing with clients in a national security context, especially if you're dealing with clients who don't have a lot of understanding about the law. What I'm about to give you is not a reading list, unless you want it to be one, okay? It's not a reading list unless you want it to be one. It's a frame of reference for issues that some of our clients are very familiar with. It's about lawyers as leaders, okay? If you don't believe lawyers are leaders, hey, please come sit next to me and I'll, um, I'll try to dissuade you of that notion. No endorsement is intended of this particular, for this particular group of folks. I'm a huge fan of self-study. Uh, I, I, I got to believe that this is one of the areas that we don't foot stomp enough with young lawyers. Uh, I had a, a boss once, uh, one of the captains in the office, he said, hey, ma'am, why, why am I supposed to, what am I supposed to, uh, 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 I have to go over to these meetings. I'm going to these meetings all the time. When do I do my work and when do I learn the law? She said, oh, that's why you have evenings and weekends. Yeah. Mm. Yes, and she was kind of right. We have an obligation under Rule 1.1 to be competent. This is the Rule 2.1 that we talked about a little bit earlier about our knowledge about all these other factors that we need to know about. 
When I was a judge, I made a common practice whenever I sat down, to, even if I was doing, trying a uh, guilty plea judge alone case, I'd read RCM 1001 from cover to cover every single time. It didn't take that much time, but it, it really cemented those things in my head, and I loved it when counsel did it as well. Here's a great book. I hear people cite it all the time, and they're not lawyers that do it. It's called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. Uh, and I'll, uh, the way I'll hear this sometimes come up in conversation is I'll be dealing with somebody who maybe has a bit of a business background. They'll say, hey, we'll work it into a, con a conversation. I'll say, yeah, this is very important because you know, Brian, what got you here won't get you there. They're checking to see if I know what they're talking about. It's a really good book. Um, it talks about the trouble with success. Congratulations, you've all been incredibly successful in order to get to this point. Um, this, is, this is kind of fun. I've just kind of laid out the big four sections here if you're interested. Here's a book that, uh, that I use a lot. It's called Getting Things Done. Uh, it's, uh, I, I had the privilege of hearing David Allen speak once, uh, and sometimes I have learned that, that I'm always asking and reminding myself these particular questions. I had a boss once say, hey, Brian, you know, sometimes the toughest questions in life are sometimes the most simple. Who are you? What do you want? Where are you going? Well, in the hybrid environment, I think, who's my client? Who are my teammates? What's the priority? What's the end state? And what's my, what, what do I need to update in the book that I carry around with me? Okay, Sometime, and, and this is a great book if you want to try to frame that. And I would commend it especially to young, young uh, uh, lawyers who are trying to get organized and, uh, uh, and understand how you're going to mold your own practice. There's a book out there by Cotter. It's called Understanding Change. I will guarantee you senior executives, uh, especially if they've been through an MBA-type program, they're going to be familiar with this book. I would recommend that you get familiar with it as well if you're not already. Uh, I love all of these. I'll just pick a couple of them. Uh, Ip's Book of Economics is one that, uh, that I have really fa fallen in love with. Uh, it's one that, that really explains a lot of business and economic type stuff in a very commonsensical way that lawyers need to be able to understand. Gerstner's book is about his takeover um, when he came in and led IBM uh, really out of, the, uh, uh, out of its crisis. Okay? So if you're dealing with a client who's managing a crisis situation, I would commend that book to you. Uh, Simon Sinek, Start With Why and The Goal. Um, both of those are, are uh, about how to operate and build loyalty in a business. Those of you who are in the business of law, uh, I would recommend The Goal to you. It talks about the theory of constraints. It's a, it's a novel about manufacturing. Yeah, I said that. It's a novel about manufacturing. It sounds incredibly boring, but it's really, it's really kind of fun. I also keep a copy of the DSM-5 in close reach. <laughs> possible obvious reasons. I believe as well, leaders need to take care of their people. They need to take care of each other, and they need to take care of themselves. Okay, I believe that. And we don't train lawyers about that probably enough. So if you, if you have the opportunity uh, to take a look at any of these, um, it's definitely, definitely, definitely worth your while. Leaders are also open to new ideas. Um, this is about collaborative leadership. And I've had a lot of folks um, mention this to me because it really is the antithesis a little bit about what we're used to learning about leadership in a military context, all right? Collaborative leadership is where one person's vote doesn't carry the day, okay? It's kind of the antithesis to what we're used to thinking about in a military context, right? Other people who are coming into our hybrid teams think like this, maybe. Collaborative leadership is a, it's a personal opportunity. Think of, in other words, think about, hey, excluding you as the leader, who else is shaping change in an organization? I love it. Um, this is a great little, little uh, nuggeletto about uh, hot desking. And uh, 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 if you're not familiar with that, it's, it's a great thing to go out and Google. You'll, you'll understand why it's entertaining, at least to me. This is an article. It's incredibly brief. Um, it'll take you literally maybe about 30 seconds, maybe 45 seconds to read through it. I will confess to you that this is probably the one thing that I've read in about the last year that changed my thinking the most. It's about, it, it's titled Bla, uh, on Vladimir Putin black swans and pink flamingos. If you're familiar with the black swan theory, black swan, it's a book uh, that, that uh, uh, it's not, I'm not talking about the movie. Um, black, the, the black swan is about um, new things that people find and new things that people encounter and they think, oh my gosh, it's a great new thing. Have, nobody's ever seen this thing before. This particular author, I could talk for hours about this book, um, a definition of a black swan event is something that's a surprise to governments, experts, and outside observers. It's an event that has a major impact. And after the first instance, it's rationalized by hindsight. In other words, we all kind of stroke our beards and say, yes, yes, we're very wise. We should have seen that coming. Pink flamingos are the ugly things. 
They're the ugly things that are parked in your neighbor's front yard and you don't want to look at, okay? The author submits that, you know, some things that we call black swans, they're really pink flamingos. He talks about this in the context of the Russians in Crimea. Everybody looked at, he says, some people looked at it in hindsight and said, oh, that's a black swan. In reality, it was an ugly thing that we should have seen coming. Huh, interesting way to look at life. Um, so how do we protect ourselves in this? I would really, really, really com commend this to you in, if you're in a leadership position at all. I would really commend this article to you to think about um, uh, the, kind of the, the dichotomy between these two things. The lesson from reading both of these two things together, at least to me, is to be aware of your own lack of predictive ability. In other words, you know, we're not as smart as we think we are. Um, we got to evaluate our, how we're biased. That's a hard thing. We don't like to do that very often. And we have to build robustness and breadth within our organizations to deal with these pink flamingos and black swans when they come up. I'll go ahead and leave it here. Who's responsible for your and my education and training? I'm a huge fan of this, especially from an ethical point of view. I believe this lawyer believes that we have an obligation to make sure that we do this stuff. It's important to me, and I hope it's important to you. Um, we are right on time, time on target. Um, thank you very much for your time and attention, everybody, today. If anybody wants to chat about any of this stuff, I'm more than happy to hang out. All right? Thanks, everybody. Brian, thank you very much for a truly spectacular presentation. Uh, it, it really is, uh, you took it to a whole different level, and, and you left us with, I think, everybody with important lessons. Exactly, as usual, you, you exceeded my very high expectations. Uh, one of the things, just a side note, a lot of my students might have noticed the PowerPoint. Well, Brian, I kind of learned it from, from Brian. Really, way back when, when he developed a concept called visual forensics, because especially younger people are visual learners. Uh, I think 65% of law students are visual learners, which is one reason I use, as my students will testify, I use a lot of PowerPoint in my, in my presentation, but excellent. Uh, we've actually come to the end of, of our conference, and I hope that you found it to be as stimulating and as interesting as, as I have. Uh, I do want to say a couple of administrative things before we close. If you are, <clears throat> are looking for CLE credit, remember you need to sign uh, every day. We had a lot of people sign yesterday, not so many today, so make sure that you do sign this CLE uh, list outside. And, <clears throat> and it, we will be sending out a survey. You know, it's great to see uh, uh, some of our regulars. Steve is, is one of our regulars, uh, General Kilpatrick. Uh, uh, Professor Forbes, uh, you know, so many of our regulars, uh, but we want to hear from our new folks uh, and what we can do next year. It, uh, we'll be sending out a survey. We really do want your inputs, especially ideas for, for next year. Uh, and I, there's a lot of people I want to thank, but I want to start about thanking you all for coming. Uh, it, really, it really makes all the work uh, so much worth the effort to see the response that we get for this conference, and it really is a wonderful thing. And I'd also like to thank our students who have supported us. Uh, and first, I, though, I'd like to, the students who came, like our friends from Florida Coastal School of Law. But I also like to thank our student volunteers, uh, especially, and many of them are members of our National Security Law Society, which Alex and uh, and Sarah, please stand up. I think our officers in the in the organization. So those of you who may not be part of it or maybe from another institution would like to link out with them, I suggest you do that afterwards. Um, I'd also uh, like to thank my wife who put up with uh, not so much fun the last couple of months. And. Um, and she has an important input here. She says, make sure you tell everybody to turn in their badges because, uh, believe it or not, uh, we are very austere with our funding, which brings up another point here that I wanted to mention. Actually, uh, as you probably know, it, it cost us about $110, $115 per person to put on this conference. And, uh, and we have a lot of what I call scholarships coming to all the military people. A lot thanks to uh, Rob Springs' gift, uh, we were able to extend that. 
Uh, the conference does consume about 80-85% of our entire center's budget. Uh, so if you, can, if you can help us, that's great, because the more we, you know, we would like to, to do more for the students, and, and one of my goals is to try to extend our reach into other, into other communities, other law schools, other parts of, of, of our world, which needs to know, I think, about some of the developments that we heard about in the last day and a half in the national security arena. Um, and, but I, I can't close the conference without talking about Victoria and uh, Stephanie. I, I don't know if they're, if they're handy, but uh, I can tell you, uh, you know, Victoria's my assistant. Imagine the, that little piece of hell that she lives in, being my assistant. And, but Stephanie, there, there's, there's Victoria and, and Stephanie. And Stephanie, uh, you know, is the law school's conference coordinator, but she has just done a magnificent job. I can't begin, any of, especially those in the military, this is like a deployment times 10 of trying to organize. And uh, especially uh, some of the challenges that we had this year, uh, it was particularly uh, gratifying to have the opportunity to work with her, a really tremendous person. So, um, Thank you very much, and look forward to, please follow our website because there will be other activities and things, and we always, you're, you're in our family, and we want to see you again. And follow our, our new blog, and give me inputs if you want to post on there. Thank you so much. See you next year, if not sooner.